Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have Dr. Melvin Lorian, and he is one of our podcast community team members, and today he's here to talk about politics and the cores and values about politics and things that are related in this aspect. Now, Dr. Um, uh, Laurie has a really great um, past experience. He started off in the medical field and he helped many people in mental health. And then he also even helped people with disabilities. As time went on, he really developed a passion in politics and he became very active in his community. He uh, actually uh, went into politics. And today he's here to talk about the cores and values and morals that are related in politics and in our society today and where we're headed. So Dr. Laurie, can you tell everybody a little about yourself and uh, we'll get right into this because I can't wait. This is an ex a really exciting topic and something that we really need to talk about in today's society. Sure. Well, I think the thing that uh, has helped me to formulate a lot of my ideas, theories, uh, is not just my uh, obvious uh, uh, background in schools and in fellowships, but the fact that I've been doing psychiatry for so long it helps me I, with two things, I think, that are a bit unique. One is psychiatrists listen with the third ear. What does that mean? That means we're always looking at li listening for something else, another meeting. Uh, we're looking behind what the person's telling us, get a little deeper, get a little better understanding of things. The other thing is psychiatrists are, are trained to deal with people's associations. So if someone talks about something for a few minutes or a few seconds, and then jumps to something else that doesn't seem connected, it's probably connected. But the question is how? And therein lies the secret to a lot of, to, to really to uncovering what gets people stuck. So uh, I just, I do this naturally. And uh, when I look at society, I do that. And, and, and so I come up with some you know, theories about how things work. So for example, um, you know, we were not talking before about people valuing uh, ha others having their own opinion. And that's that's a moral value in, in our society. It's good, not bad, it's good to, to let other people express their thoughts and their feelings. Of course, what's going on now is a bit the reverse. So a lot of people that are more traditional think of what's going on as bad because there's, a can there's canceling, uh, there's uh, a lot of not allowing certain speakers on campus, for example. So people talk about it as free speech uh, being suppressed. Well, it gets a little technical, constitutional, whatever. But the point is the value on having multiple ideas expressed and on giving others a chance to express theirs has been part of America, part of what's made our culture great and that's why a lot of us are concerned about what's happening today. So uh, I want to I wanted, just want to start off also by saying, I'm what I'm talking about has some constants, but there's a lot of generalizations in what I'll be talking about, because when I give examples of of certain things in, in terms of how they play out in real life, well, different people have different experiences, and they might not agree with me. Fine, it, it it ties into what you're just talking about. Yeah. So so uh, be be patient and try to listen for what the the constant themes are. So that's my caveat when it comes to morals and values. So morals and values really it has to do with right and wrong. What's right to do? What's wrong to do? What's good to do? What's bad to do? And having this capacity as humans must have a reason. There must be something that adapts us to life. That's why it's there, this capacity to have morals and values. And when I ask myself, what is, what's the advantage that we have? I come back to survival and reproduction. Mm -hmm. Survival, we know, and reproduction is what doesn't get talked about after you talk about birth. You don't get much about reproductive development. But anyway... What's the value that having morals and knowing right and wrong, what is the value that, that has for our society? Well, for one, it helps us get along in society. Yes. And if, if we didn't have a mutual sense of what's right and wrong, 
we don't we wouldn't get along if we said everything that's on our mind people wouldn't like us uh so we know we know very quickly uh that there's a kind of a more, more of a less standard uh it's loose but there's a standard uh in our society and there's a standard in families there's certain things that are right and wrong in a family that are not necessarily right or wrong can be opposites in society so there's a variation to that too there's something that's called guilty anxiety. So if we do something or we see something that's wrong, we think the person's guilty. But if we do something that's wrong, we feel guilty. And what we're really feeling is called guilty anxiety. What's the anxiety? Well, we did something wrong. People aren't going to like us. Our parents aren't going to like us. The person I did something wrong to isn't going to like us. It's a social adaptation, and it even happens when there's no one else around because it's incorporated into our minds. Right. So that's that's the that's the issue about guilt. It's important to keep in mind. It's been said that guilt is the glue of society. So we don't do things that are wrong. It keeps society rolling. Wrong in terms of our society. It keeps society rolling. We don't say things that are inappropriate or because that, because that's wrong. Right. And, and if we do say things that are inappropriate, we're not going to be quite as accepted or liked in our society. We're not going to get as far in a job. We're not going to have as much family uh, cohesion as we could otherwise. So that, that, that mechanism of guilty anxiety keeps us in line with the culture. Yeah. We don't do things that are wrong. We don't do things that are bad. And if we do, we feel this guilty anxiety. So let's go to a little bit about other cultures. So people talk about the bad guys, the mafia, let's say the mafia. Okay. So, so they say, well, the mafia does things that are wrong. You know, they extort money and they, they do dr you know, sell drugs and they kill people. But within that culture, there is a sense of morals. So if you cross the line, if you snitch, that's immoral, that's wrong, and you're going to pay for it. Right. In the movie, in the movie Goodfellas, Joe Tecci shoots, it turns out, a senior a mafia man. He just shoots and kills him in a bar. He must have been drinking or whatever. Right. Later on, later on, when he's about to get into the real core of the mafia, they kill him. Because he did something bad. You don't kill other mafia members. Right. Well, that's so the point is that that this all it's all very relative. So let's take another another example. You know this golden rule, the golden rule? Yeah. Do unto others as we would like others to do unto us. Right. Well, there's a problem with that. Because <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the person doesn't like it when you do what's good for you. And and you think it'd be good for that person. For example, an elderly person is crossing the street and you go up and help the elderly person. Right. And he shrugs you off. Why? Because his value is still on autonomy. And when you try to help him, yes. that doesn't feel good for him. So projecting your sense of what's right and wrong is accurate a lot of the time, but it's not always accurate. That's true. So it's just important to, to you know to keep keep that in mind. So an, another aspect of morals and values has to do with religion. And you know, I grew up like this, and a lot of most most people in society, not all anymore, will say, "How can you be a moral person if you don't have a religion? If you don't follow a religion?" Right. Because you know, religions nowadays. Teach what's right and wrong. You're good to your fellow man, that kind of thing. Perhaps a couple of thousand years ago, if there were something called a religion, it might, what's good and bad might be conquering another nation. Yeah. Depends on the situation. But in our society, which is pretty stable, uh, the the uh, uh, religions teach us to be good, yes. avoid what's bad, and they define it, for example, giving to other people, sharing, uh, helping others, that kind of thing. And it obviously keeps society rolling.
Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so let's talk about though, how all this happens, how the mafia develops its own set of morals, how religious people develop their sense of morals. And as I found out, as I grew up, people that are atheists have a morality. They do too. And it's, it overlaps pretty much. It's pretty right. human. So, you know, it's been said that if you, it, that's that one or two popes have said, and different, different uh, accounts will name different popes. But what the saying is, if you give me a boy until he's seven, I'll give you a Catholic for life. <laughs> because the morals and values stick at an early age. Yes. And they apply. The right, you do the right thing according to that religion. You know, it even works with the Romans. Well, they had religion. They had, they were pagans. But I've heard the same statement said, if you, if you make a, a boy a Roman for seven years, Yes. He's a Roman for life. Right. So, um, so, okay. So how does this, um, how does this really happen? How does it, how does it happen that this comes into our mind? Well, genetically, I believe, and I don't think there's much argument that we are born with this capacity to be moral or to know what morals are, to know what good and bad are. Right. But that but the question is how it's shaped in yes. each family, in each religion, in each culture. So one of the things that that happens is that these the, the different morals are learned. What's good is learned. So for example, if you do what your parent wants you to do, you get some praise. That's because you did something good. Right. And if you did something that the parent didn't want you to do, like hit your little brother, you don't get praise. You don't, might get chastised, might get punished. Right. And that's bad. That's considered bad. Now, there are things in the middle that you might do that your parent doesn't want to hold, start a big thing about. So the parent might not say anything, but you're not praised. So you're not going to do it more. And you're not chastised, criticized. So you're not going to do it less. You right. just do it. Okay, so there's again there's a, a spectrum there. So then there's a question of how how we learn. So there's several ways that we learn. One way is by identifying with our parents. We learn what's a good idea to do. We learn what's moral to do. When our parents do something that that, for example, when they criticize others for, then they do it themselves. Yeah, that's wrong. And we might confront our parents or not, but. We, we have learned the difference between right and wrong at a pretty early age, pretty early age. Uh, so, so this is a powerful way we learn. And when our parents do something a certain way, how they treat people, how they organize themselves to, to cook, to cook a meal, uh, to uh, fix a car, we incorporate those into our own lives, our own situations. We've learned that. Yes. So there's another way that we learn. We learn by associations. So for the classic example is Pavlov's dog. So Pavlov was studying dogs and he had did an operation or so that the saliva of a dog would uh, accumulate in his little pouch or something like that. Right. And uh, so when it was mealtime, he would ring a bell and the dog would come get his food and then he'd deal with his saliva. Mm -hmm. After a while, he realized that he didn't have to be there. <laughs> if the bell rang, the dog would come. Right. The dog associated the bell with Pavlov and with food. Right. You see? So that's how that dog learned by association. And we do the same things. We learn by association. If we do things, things turn out right. We tend to do them more. Yes. Associated success with whatever we were doing. Now there's a kind of learning called operate, operant conditioning or operant learning. And this is what a parent can control because the parent can give, a, a, we, I call it a pellet of praise, as we were talking about before, pellet right. of praise, or a pellet, not give a pellet of praise and maybe, uh, maybe be even punished. So the parent teaches the child what's right 
and what's wrong. The right way to do things, the right way to treat people, mm -hmm. the right way to study as you get older, to study for school, to do your job. And if you're, again, if your parents do it in a way that's successful, productive, you got a good chance of being that way when you grow up. If your parents are very inconsistent, they say one thing, they do another, a, a lot, because parents always do it to some extent. Yeah. Then you're going to be a little confused and not know what's exactly right or wrong in the subtle situations, in, in, the, in the close ones. So another thing about morals is that even though we learn them when we're young, for example, the the uh, boy who's uh, worked by the Pope until he's seven or the Roman boy becomes a Roman and forever if he's a Roman till seven. Right. There's, it's not that fixed, actually. For example, if you take a job, uh, a certain kind of job, after a while, the things you do are valued. They're good. You feel good when you've done them. Might be building something. You might take another job that does that demolition. Yes. And then what's good is how you demolish something. You see, so there's a little, well, you can call it plasticity, there's a little variation on that, but pretty much the fundamentals, the fundamentals are learned very early on. Yes, they definitely are. So that's, uh, I mean, I again, I hope your viewers can think of examples where this fits and let me know if there are areas where what I'm saying doesn't fit because again, I'm talking in, in generalizations. Yes. There's so much variation among people that it's hard to get an example that works for everybody. Right now, we have a lot of viewers that are in agreement with you. But the problem what I find, too, is that a lot of times when children are, are um, from, from, from childhood and on, they have parents that teach them right and wrong, right and wrong, according to the way they grew up. And according to the way their their parents grew, you know, raised them. But then it's also the fear of rejection. If I, you know, that guilt that we were talking about. If I don't do what mom and dad taught me to do, then I'm letting them down. We talked about the shame part, you know, feeling shameful and guilt because I'm not doing what mom and dad taught me to. I, you know, the fear of rejection. That, you know, not only will, you know, as we get older and become adults, we don't realize it, but that that fear of rejection, if they're, if our parents are still alive, we in our head, we don't want them to feel um, reject us and reject the actions that we're doing. If they see us being our own person and we're not doing the way we were taught, then, you know, that fear that mom and dad are going to be disappointed in me, even though we're in our 40s, 50s, 60s and older, we're still following what our parents want us to do. But who are we? If we live a life where we are constantly trying to please our parents and please our family according to the way we were raised, then we are losing a part of us. Who are we as a person? What are our interests? What are our beliefs? Who are we as a person? And there is a time where I think it's healthy to really to step back and think about who we are as people, what our interests are, and who we need to be in order to feel that self-satisfaction and gratification. And, you know, our parents raised us with, let's say if they did raise us with good morals and values, now it's time to step back and think, okay, now I have to see who I am as a person, use those core values and morals, but become my own person. But I see so many individuals in society, they have a hard time breaking away from what they were taught as, as young children, that they are constantly, their entire lives, trying to please mom and dad. Even when they pass on, they're still doing what they think mom and dad wanted them to do. So in, in a sense that, you know, and then it, I think it affects them mentally because they're not feeling that self-gratification. They're not feeling that full satisfaction in life because they are not who they actually want to be. They're still trying to please that fear rejection is following them, you know, and, and you made a great point also is that you know, people pleasers, we're constantly trying to do what we think is the right thing, but other people, 
may not feel it's the right thing as well. Like when you said that, you know, you help, let's say that person helps the, the elderly person across the street. Well, that person, it feels independent. They know they're older, but they can do it. They don't want your help. But you, in your head, you're thinking, you know, they're older, they need my help, you know, but then it works in reverse. You know, that person is getting a little angry that you're trying to help them, even though your intentions are good. So it really, core morals and values are different to each person. And another thing I'm going to throw at you, I know I've thrown a lot of things at you, is that in our society, over 70% of our society comes from dysfunctional families. So if you're coming from a dysfunctional family and you're, you're incorporating behaviors that aren't healthy, and then you're, you're installing those and, and, and it keeps on passing and passing, you know, it's, you know, what are the, you know, wh how do we break those bad core, core values and morals? They, you know, we have, you know, we talked about how much hatred there is in this world today, how much, you know, you it's, it's almost impossible nowadays to share your own moral and values to others and to, to share your opinion. Because back in the day, we had sitcoms on TV, people joked around, no one took things to heart. Nowadays, you say things and people go at each other's throats for just sharing your opinion. But we just express that everybody comes from a different set of footprints and that we're all going to have our own opinions, our own values, our own moral. It doesn't mean anyone is right or wrong. It just means that we're different individuals. We grew up differently and it's, we need to be our own person and not be, you know, not be, um, uh, you know, I'm looking for the right word, but, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, cast yourself, you know, uh, you know, um, I guess the right word would be, you know, we shouldn't be shunned for having our own, our own, you know, our own opinions, our own morals, our own values. Everyone's entitled as long as we're not hurting other human beings. We're all entitled yes. to our own opinions and values, you know. So this is, uh, this is our culture. This is the, up, up until maybe recently, the American culture values that. We want to give their, uh, our children that the ability, the sense that it's good, it's certainly okay to be different. Now, then the question is how different, different yes. families do it different ways. But one of the things that as parents, if we don't do that, our children, they, they're lost because they keep doing things in say one way and society is different. So one of the things that does happen that kind of a, takes a, this into account automatically, it's not like anybody thought it up, is that what the parents start to teach their children is ref is what's reflected in the society in general. So, for example, if the society in general says, well, uh, blacks are inferior, right? This is what it was in certain er times of the country and in certain areas of the country. So they can teach their child that blacks are inferior because it, it jives with the culture. But if a parent realizes that everyone's basically equal there's no you know there's no uh a reason to assume someone's something without learning about that something and that then the parent starts to teach that to the kids then when the kids grow up they're more in sync yes with their culture and they're they're free they're not fighting it they're not feeling ostracized because they're doing things in a different way Right. So it's it's not again, it's not just the parents. The parents are influenced by their culture and that influence kind of shapes the way the parents will raise the child. Now, what's happened in our society about this value that we put on expressing our own opinions, you know, that's one of the secrets. That's one of the secrets of America's success, because in order to adapt to environment as your environment changes, there has to be variation. There has to be some people who are, are this way, some people are that way, some people are the other way. And then if something happens in society, then the people who happen to fit with that can carry on. Yes. But if you have, you know, if you have a value placed on not saying anything critical about the government, which happens in authoritarian states, yes. um, then you're like a clone. You can't really readily adapt 
to right. different situations. So uh, the value on the individual is a fundamental difference between the West and the East, the two, those two cultures. What's right in our culture is wrong in their culture, and they see us as wrong. Right. You see? Yes. So, And we see them as wrong, too, because they're, they're yeah. shutting everyone up, and we believe in everyone expressing ourselves. Um, as, as long as people kind of keep that in mind, um, it's, life's a little more, more smooth. And the, the diplomats, that's what being diplomatic is, the diplomats can keep those things in mind. They don't get so uh, worked up if, say, a government we consider terrible yeah. does something in a certain way. They deal with it, but they don't have to get upset about it. Um, but most people will think the communist system is bad and the free market system is good. But there are other people who, who don't. This is, this is how culture evolves. Yeah. And it evolves, it evolves with the time. Let me give you a, what I think is a great example of this. Yeah. In the 60s, things loosened up in terms of relationships. It used to be in colleges that there were think these rules called parietal rules, rules of the house. Yes. First of all, there are boys' dorms, girls' dorms. Mm -hmm. And if the boy was in the girls' dorm too long or whatever it was, that's violating a parietal, that's bad. Right. As the 60s evolved, the, the students are all together on yeah. the same floor in the same <laughs> dorm. Right. What, what happened? And then it's reflected in many ways. People now live together without getting married. Right. And it's accepted. Used to be, used to be if you wanted to get in a hotel with, with a, a girlfriend, you, you had to kind of pretend you were married because. Yeah. Okay. So what happened though in the 60s that I think allowed this, this to happen? The pill came in. The pill freed up women, but it also freed up men. Because sex did not have to result in pregnancy or childbearing if you didn't want it to. So that extra sense of control was fine. Because you had that, you didn't have to be that strict about keeping the boys and girls together yeah. or men and women living together. Now, so the, the, our culture has changed. Our culture has changed to a large extent because of a technological advance that is the pill. Right. Now we have technological advance, a big one, which is social media. Yes. And it allows, it allows communication that never existed before. Right. Obviously, in some ways, this is terrific because you can shed sunlight. We talked about this another time. You can yeah. shed sunlight on situations, and that's the best antiseptic. Right. But then people can abuse that. You know, they flood it with uh, uh, fake uh, usernames or whatever, and it distorts. What, what's going on. So, uh, I mean, I think this, I think Elon Musk is trying to deal with this. Right. Uh, the thing that, that has made him hesitate in buying Twitter was he didn't know how many bots, how many robots there were sending tweets. And uh, of course they, they didn't tell him, but that was his concern. He was concerned that it wasn't real people talking. That was his value. That's our value. Right. right? And he's still struggling with this. Yeah. He's still struggling this on twitter but you know at least he's struggling with it he's trying i i think he's trying uh and i think most people would agree that if you have a true free exchange of ideas you're much better off if you have fake ones you don't know where you stand yeah For technology's sure. great sometimes technology is used in the wrong way right but it has a lot to do with our culture I yes think. it does and I want to encourage people, if you have a question for Dr. Laurie, please ask him because now is the time if you have questions or even if you have a disagreement where you feel that maybe a comment of his is not in agreement with your comment, let him know and let him, you know, talk to you or even debate you or have a comment to like uh, reinforce what he's trying to explain. But I think one of the problems too is, is you know, what scares me is AI now. AI is coming to the picture where they alter pictures pictures, they alter voices. It looks like the person. And, you know, even before I was going to make that comment, as you were speaking, I was thinking about 
all the hatred, you know, so social media has stirred up, you know, people are at each other's throats. You know, democracy is supposed to be, you know, you have the Republicans, the Democrats, the independents, they all think differently, but they all have some things in common. But it's a, it's a, it's what the great thing about the United States is that we have a democracy where we can come together and try to get some type of happy medium. So, but right now I see so much cutting edge throat behavior where everyone's at each other's throats. Everyone is, is there is so much hatred. Um, you know, the people who live in the United States, a lot of people have so much anger and hatred and they're throwing it out there. And instead of just thinking like we were speaking, we all have our own opinions. Let's come together and unify and let's figure out a way that we could put all our thoughts all these ideas together and come out with some really great ideas, the world would be such a better place in the United States. Right now, I see so many people, you can you can be in a room and you can see two people starting to get into anger. I've seen people get so angry that they're almost in a fist fight because they have a difference of opinion about the government or democracy or Republican or Democrat. And it shouldn't be like that. Yes, like we will go back in our beginning of our conversation. We all grew up differently. We all have opinions. But it, it shouldn't get to the point where violence comes in the picture, hatred comes in the picture. You know, in order for us to stand strong as a nation, we need to be honest. We need to try to be, uh, you know, a unified country where we come together as one to make things better. And if I feel like things are starting to fall apart. It's like, where has things gone in our country? I just don't understand, you know, the way things are starting to, you know, evolve. And I, I don't like what I'm seeing. I, you see so many people, you know, the, we talk about, um, morals and values and opinions you you see so many people going into places and just uh, taking out guns and just shooting people randomly because of conspiracies that they see on the internet anger issues you know you see people getting into fist fights you see you saw what happened when they when the, when all those people went to congress and they they broke in it, it was it, you know it it just blows my mind and it scares me at the same time well, you know, when you see all this, and I've been around for longer than you have, <laughs> um, I, I, I think, you know, I would say so for sure. Um, so uh, that this is uh, not as spontaneous as it seems. It's contrived. There are, there are puppeteers who are very good at stirring things up. And the, the basic tenet that they seem to have is to stir things up is to split the country and thus weaken it. This has uh, happened in many other countries. And one question is, why is America letting it happen? Letting yes. it happen. Mm -hmm. you know? one, and I'll, I'll tell you one reason. Because in the 30s, there was an attempt to do that. In the 60s, there were riots and attempts to do that. Yes. Now there are more, and it's going a lot further. I believe that one of the reasons is because something I talked about before, that our society has become so secure. We all have such a sense of security. And that's what I've called for your audience who wasn't there before, um, outside the nest behavior to gather food for the nest, to gather things, to gather money for the nest, and to protect it against would-be intruders. If you read about the animal kingdom, you'll see that theme. Yeah. But inside the nest, it's not the concern so much about intruders. They don't, they, they don't think of them necessarily as intruders. They're just people coming in. And so for a lot of people, the immigration isn't a threat. It's, it's For some, it's very neutral. They don't care one way or the other. And for others, they think it's a good thing because a lot of poor, underprivileged people come in. Right. It's And so it's, that's just one example of how the society has morphed from focusing on survival to focusing on reproduction. The environment is another one. The environment, to keeping the environment clean is not just human, birds do it. Bir birds carry off the waste of their fledglings from the nest, so the nest is clean. 
um, dogs, you know, maybe it's not all species, will eat the, scat, the waste of their puppies until their puppies are weaned. Keeping it clean. Well, we have a value on cleanliness. And so, of course, we want to keep our environment clean. Right. The question is how it is extended to really a ruinous level where people are so focused on it, they can't get off it. Yeah. And, and and so, so much is, is expended on just that one issue. And then you look at another issue, which is, say, uh, taking care of the poor. That's an in the nest value, taking care of the the, the less uh, independent, the more dependent people, where they're disabled, where they just can't get going. And that starts to clash with other things because it costs a lot of money. So the other things cost a lot of money. And eventually, in the old days, before all this happened, people worked it out. Yeah. They they and this was this was a value on compromise. Some people say, you know, you shouldn't compromise your values. Well, to some extent, there's a value on compromising. They're your values. Yeah. When you are in a marriage, you, you better go into that with a value on reaching compromise yeah. because it, it won't work otherwise. That's And in our government, that value is no longer there. It used to be there. It used to be it's there. not there anymore. So different, um, different values have been exploited. And if you talk to a lot of people, they feel there's a common denominator to it. And I tend to agree. It's hard to pinpoint it. Maybe that's a subject for another discussion. Yeah. Um, it's very controversial. It's very controversial. People and the press see this event as happening. They report it as if it's separate from that event. Right. But it's really, if you, it's tied together. And if they can see how it's tied together, then they can say, well, here's another example of this common theme. This happened today. Here's another example of this common theme that happened today. But when you report each one separately, the country gets split. Yeah. Things are right or wrong, environment or, or finance, where it's really some of both. Yeah. And, 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 and all kinds of other issues, too. It's some of both. If you have a value on some of both, you can function as a family. Mm -hmm. You can function as a society. That's why it appears that there's there are contrivances going on. And now scientists are starting to come out and say this. You know, scientists aren't too political. Yeah. They they kind of do their science and that's yeah. their thing. But sometimes when the society believes something that they feel is incorrect scientifically, they will start to voice their opinions. They, they, they remind you, their personality is not to get out there and uh, stand on a soapbox and tell people right. this or that is right or wrong. But when they're really asked and they're allowed to be objective about it, then you'll, you'll start to hear what's right. The, the ideologies that start do not start in the scientists, in the scientific uh, fields. They start in the humanities. Right. You think about it. And so the question is, why do they start in the humanities? Why do ideologies start in the humanities? Well, in the humanities, People are moved by ideas. Right. Right. Scientists, they take an idea and uh, they have to prove it. Right. You see, but for, every, for everyone else, if they have an idea that they think fits, it's the right way to process things, then they go with it. And unfortunately, today you have an idea, one ideology that says you shouldn't let other ideas come in, maybe because the ideas are better. Who knows? But that that's what we've come to. And I think the only way out of it is to identify puppeteers that are really behind a lot of this. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, I, so that sounds like a gross conspiracy theory. <laughs> so I'm a conspirator. <laughs> <I'm serious. laughs> <laughs> but, um, it's just, it's just, uh, you can't, you can't see all this happening at once and not think that something is behind it. Right. Some, some people or some, something is behind it, driving it. And then of course it has a life of its own. So if there are people behind taking environmental issues to a ruinous level. Right. Um, then a lot of people buy into that and they don't have to be encouraged anymore. Right. It has a life of its own. 
And this happens with, with the other issues that we're struggling with too. It's very complicated. A lot of sunlight has to come out. A lot of sunlight, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, I get in there and talk about it. Here I am talking about this. It's pretty much off the scientific bent, more psychological, I think you'd say. But it has to do with values. Yeah, It has to do with values that can be corrupted. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, is, this is a big part of it. The value you keep talking about is the value, what, what are the values that has made our country, the Western world, great? It, because we can deal with variation, variation in people's ideas. Yeah. We pick up the good ones, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, other, that's, that's a value. And that value is being uh, shunned now. Other yeah. people have a value on not letting people say what they think. Right. Well, you're going to have unsuccessful America that keeps up. Yeah. Whew. That's my, I, uh, I, I've, I've thought about that a lot too, and I could go into it more, but I think we're, you know, starting with morals and how they develop and how they change yeah. is, um, is really what I wanted to get into today. Cause I think that, um, that guilt is the glue. That is a good moral sense is the glue, a shared moral sense of what's appropriate in this situation or that situation yeah. is what keeps our social life functioning, our country functioning. I, I agree with you. I, I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, we need some rules and regulations on, and to get those puppeteers out, because I think we, we do have quite a few of those puppeteers, a lot of them lately in, in our world of, of politics. And then they're drawing our society, certain people, certain behave people with certain types of characteristics and behaviors that are easily maneuvered to be able to pull their strings and get them to do what they want. And it's kind of like getting them on their side and making their, their, their society stronger so they could get their way. And people are, be a lot of people in the United States, I feel are being manipulated and they're not seeing the truth. And these are the people that they're targeting, those easily manipulated people that don't have those core values and morals that, you know, maybe they grew up in a society where you talked about, you know, there was no, um, there was no reward and there was no, you know, chastise, you know, uh, they didn't get in trouble when they did something wrong. So they don't know that, that happy medium, you know, when, you know, what is really good and what is really bad. They're kind of confused because mom and dad didn't set those core values and morals. So those people sometimes I think have a little bit of a, a confusion. You know, if they didn't, if they didn't ha stabilize those good cores, uh, those good morals and values as they got older, maybe from their spouse or from a, a group of people they hung out with and they saw what, what good values and cores were and they picked it in, picked up those behaviors. If they're still in the middle, they're kind of confused of what's right and what's wrong and they want to fit in somewhere. And That's right. Yes, and that's how gangs start. When the parents don't have a moral uh, uh, path for their children, the, the kids feel lost. They don't know what way to go. They don't know what's right and wrong. Think of a football game. If you didn't have rules, everybody would be standing on the field wondering what you do next. Yeah. So so where do they get it? You're right. The sense, the sense of belonging, which is pretty human, part mm -hmm. of our, we're a social species. Um, they'll get it from gangs. Another question is why certain parents don't give these things to their children. And I think to a, a large extent, you're talking about mental illness. Yeah. You're talking about addiction. If a, if a parent is depressed, they kind of sit there. Nothing matters. So their kids can do all kinds of things. Yeah. right things and wrong things by our standards but this parent can't even get going likewise if a parent is drunk or high they're not going to be able to really tune into their children and you know bef as before the children have to find some community somewhere to satisfy the social need and these are very likely i think as you were saying the ones who gravitate to these uh these riots these uh, ruinous uh, extensions of natural uh, aspects of our society, whether it's the environment, whether it's money, 
whether it's sexuality, it's, you know, Americans are pretty, have been pretty okay with people doing whatever they want to do in their private lives, as long as they don't hurt anybody. As you said, that's the value, as long as they don't hurt anybody. And so what happens is that value is taken to a ruinous extent. So you have, uh, for example, this, uh, a lot of people were focused on sexuality and they take it to a ruinous extent and they expose children to it. Yes. Well, that's against some of the rules of our culture. Our culture says you don't expo uh, expose children to that. Our culture says parents decide what's best for their children. But these things are changing. And, uh, that, you know, it's it's uh, that's that's the puppeteer aspect. But then yeah. there's the parent who neglects because of addiction or mental illness sometimes it's from, from a career mm -hmm. where they can't get home they can't really focus on their kids right but um at other times the parent just needs needs that help not realizing it not even accepting it and it's a gargantuan task to deal with it but i think the more people can not see others as poor or bad but see them as as having certain illnesses that aren't necessarily considered illness right uh, you, then you start to bring a lot of people into society in a functional way. Yes. Not a destructive way. Exactly. Exactly. Now, we've gone over a lot of really important issues about cores of, of morals and values. <clears throat> um, if you had to get take away a few important of these, excuse me. If you really had to wrap it up, and really take some of the things that we discussed today that you really like to emphasize to our public listeners that are listening right now, because you really have a very big following right now listening to you, and they're very interested in what you have to say. Once again, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Lori, please, um, before we go, before we wrap it up, feel free to ask him anything. Or if you even have your own opinion that you'd like to share, this is one show that you're not going to be ostracized and you're not going to be criticized. You're not going to be um, yelled at. So if you have a question or your own opinion you'd like to share, please, we encourage you to. <clears throat> but before we go, I'd really like to, to hear, you know, some important factors, some important takeaways that you really like listeners to understand because it really is important that our society realizes that it's okay to have morals and values it's okay to be your own person you know let let go of the shame let go of the guilt you know don't worry about how you were raised think about what's best for you as an individual but also remember that your opinion matters but you don't have to, it, it it not necessarily means that you have to push your opinion on others that's your opinion your view this is how you want to live your life to make you happy as a person if it works for you then wonderful because everyone needs a healthy, happy, and productive life. But don't take your core morals and values and try to push them on another individual and then punish that person for not thinking like you do. And also, you know, you made another good point. Sometimes, you know, we are, we, a lot of us tend to, you know, be pe people pleasers. They want to help others. Not everybody wants to help have help and to really know where the boundaries are and to really know when to stop you know, there are points when in life, even if you think you're doing the right thing, it might not be the right thing for the other person. So sometimes I think we have to learn what our boundaries are and really focus on our circle of life and what's best for us and the people around us as, as a whole that we care about. But um, I know I, I, I kind of, you know, this is your time to talk, not mine, but uh, those are a couple of things I just, you know, got from you that I thought were really important to emphasize myself. So I just wanted to bring those out before you, you know, gave away a few of your, your takeaways. But, you know, I, I think it's important that people understand that, you know, we as humans all have the right to have our own views and opinions. And, you know, we have all come from different morals and values and family life. But let's not let's not push it on others and 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 hurt others or be angry towards others because they don't think like us. But what are your your takeaways on everything we discussed today that you really like the audience to understand and really put some thought into for today? 
Well, I think that, uh, first of all, there are the core values that we all share, and they're learned uh, in the home growing up in most households, in functional households. And then the morals of dealing with society are kind of variable, and you have to be careful lest you assume other people have the same line of morals that you do. They can be slightly different. You know that example of helping the older person across the street? Yeah. The older person to be ready if the person says, no, 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 I want to do it myself. Let them. But maybe you can kind of walk behind them a little bit and keep your eye on them just in case there's a, yeah. something does happen, you know? Exactly. So then you've, you split the difference. You've done something moral and you've done it in an adaptive way because you can help, potentially help this person exactly. if it, if that person needs it. That So that this is... Uh, this I think is the uh, is the thing to keep in mind, and it sometimes is very painful to hold to your morals when you really want to do something else. You do you do another thing because it's the right thing to do. Right. This is a human condition. This mm -hmm. makes us functional. We have to remember that if we do the wrong thing, we have guilty anxiety. So we do the right thing. We have guilt that is the glue of society. It yeah. keeps us acting in what we know is the right way. Very well put, very well put. I, you know, I think today was a, a very um, amazing conversation. I am very glad that you came on the show today to talk about this topic. I, I, you know, I feel like this is this is one thing that really needs to be tapped into. Before the show, we talked about a couple of things that really need to be discussed in, you know, and and that are prevalent in our society. But I, I really think that people, you know, you know, the way they were raised does play a big part. From the moment that you're conceived, from the moment that you're held in your mother's arms, from the moment that you're raised, the 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 attention, the love, the discipline that you receive, it all it all stems into who you are as a person, and and the and the and the trauma you've gone through life, and these all play a role in who we are as a person. But there was always room to change. I just want to say that before we go, you know, our our morals and our values, you know, they they are with us. But we could also be open minded enough to say, is it working in our life? Is it is it really is it the things that I'm doing right now? Is it really benefiting me as a person? Is it benefiting the people I love? Is it benefiting the people that are part of my society that I live in? And then if, and be honest with yourself, because I think a lot of people are in denial and they don't like to admit when they're wrong. But personally, if you ask yourself that question, try to be honest with yourself because honesty is key and say, are these things working in my life? And maybe if they're not working and you don't see a lot of great things happening from the actions and from the behaviors you're exemplifying, maybe it's time to think about your core values and your morals and maybe make some adjustments and see if it betters you as a person, see if it makes the people around you happier, and it might even make you happier as a person because it might put you on a different pathway, a pathway that's more productive, a pathway that actually gives you the things that you need in life to feel more fulfilled as a person and a human being. So remember, in life, there is always room to change. And the values and the morals that we grew up with, it always is always, it, it's not permanent. Anything in life that we have inside ourselves mentally, we can change. Just like if we change our health, we can tweak things to make our health better. We could do the same thing with our morals and our values. You know, it's time to look at ourselves, look at the society we live in, and think about what I could do as a person, you know, as to make my life better, to make society better, a better place, and to make the people around me who I care about happier and give them because we are the mentors of our children the people around us we are mentors and people have to realize that so let's look at our values let's look at our our morals and let's think about what we're doing in life and how is it affecting us and how is it affecting the people around us it's time to make changes the world needs people that are going to give positive change, positive energy, kindness, gratitude, love. These are the things we want to focus on. So look at yourself and see if these are the things you're exemplifying in life. And if you are exemplifying these things, well, keep doing what you're doing. 
But if you don't think you are, maybe it's time for change. Dr. Laurie, I love when you come on the show. I love your thoughts. I love you as a person. I think you have such a great outlook on, on, on society, on politics, on, on life itself. And I thank you very much for taking the time out to share your thoughts and to share your views with us today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. And again, I hope it's added something to the lives of your audience. Hope oh. you liked it. I, I definitely think it has. And as you know, Dr. Laurie is part of our uh, podcast team. So he will be coming on to do another show very soon. So keep your eye open. We will be advertising and, and telling you when Dr. Laurie is coming back on the show. So you can listen to the, his next episode when we go deeper into deeper topics and he can share some of his thoughts on other areas related to, to topics of psychology, politics, mental health and other, other great issues that we need to focus on. Thank you, Dr. Laurie. It's my a pleasure. Likewise. Take care. You too.